Amen. Now, in 1 Samuel chapter 13, there's a lot going on here, and I mentioned this story in this morning's sermon. And I don't know if you've noticed, but lately, oftentimes, is the case on Sundays, the sermons that I preach on Sunday night are very closely associated with the sermons that I preach on Sunday morning, and they tend to complement each other. Even though they're different sermons, and tonight's sermon is different than what I preached this morning, but they have a tendency to complement each other. And even this story is, um, you know, it, it's interesting because the the... The direction I'm going to go with this story is, is not the direction that the whole story is taking. But I mentioned this about serving God and, and, and having zeal according to knowledge. And I mentioned this event with Saul when he offered up the burnt offering unto the Lord. And, and he wanted to do what was right, but he didn't do what was right because it wasn't his job to do it. This is that very story. And we see when Samuel comes, yeah, he comes a little bit late, but... Saul was in the transgression, and Saul ends up paying for that uh, of not doing things exactly the way that God has commanded and God has laid out for him to do. We see that in this story. And what I'm preaching on tonight is actually about King David. And look down, if you would, at verse 13 when Samuel is rebuking Saul. Look at what he says in verse 13. Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord thy God, which he commanded thee. For now would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever. He's saying, look, if you would have just hearkened unto God's commandment, not broken his commandments, not did this, and taken upon yourself to offer the sacrifice, which is only for the priest to do, not for you, the king, a man of Benjamin, but someone who's of the Levites, to offer up this sacrifice unto God, if you could have just waited and, and did what you were supposed to do, your kingdom would have been established forever. But because you didn't have respect unto the commandment of the Lord, he's saying it's, you know, you're losing that spot. You're not going to be king anymore. Look at what he says in verse 14. But now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And the Lord hath commanded him to be captain over his people, because thou hast not kept that which the Lord commanded thee. And see, one of the problems with Saul was his heart. Because he gets rebuked here. He's also rebuked with the witch. He does things wrong, yet he does not want to admit when he's done wrong. He's saying, I didn't do anything wrong. Just like when he was told to destroy all the enemy. And you know, Samuel comes back. He's, he's saying, you know, and Saul's like... Well, I did everything God told me to do. And he's like, well, what means this bleeding in my ears? Why do I hear these sheep? Why do I hear these animals that you've taken back as spoil from the battle that you were supposed to have destroyed everything? And, and Saul just continues on his, his you know, defiance and his saying, he's trying to justify his own sin and saying, no, I did everything right. I did what, you know, God told me to go destroy the people. I did that. Oh, but the people... You know, they took of this. But it's for, the, it's for God. It's offer up a sacrifice unto God. And he makes all these excuses for himself. That's Saul. Well, I'm not going to be preaching on Saul tonight. But that's why the kingdom was removed from him. God removed, you know, this position that he had and took away these, these blessings that he could have had because he didn't obey God. But he gave it to a man. The Bible says that the Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. And of course, it's referring to David because David is the one that's anointed to be the next king. David is the one that's replacing Saul. So according to the Bible, David is a man that is after God's own heart. And that is a, a profound statement to think, hey, David, you know, if this is a man after God's own heart, let's take a look at David. And that's what we're going to do tonight. We're going to take a little bit of an in-depth look at David. Now, King David as a character in the Bible is very expansive. I mean, there are so many chapters, I mean, books like, you know, all of, of 2 Samuel pretty much covers the reign of King David. So there's a lot of material and, and other places. I mean, he's found in Kings, he's found in uh, 1 Samuel, he's, he's found all over the Bible. But we're going to just take some highlights of these attributes, the, the positive attributes, the positive characteristics of King David because the Bible is saying he's a man after God's own heart. So if you want to know a little bit about God's heart, hey, he, he ordained David as a man after God's own heart. 
And it's always good to look to people, godly people, as, a, as an example in our own lives and learn from them and see what the Bible says about these people that, that are good, that are positive. Now look, David had a lot of mistakes. David had a lot of flaws. Obviously, the big one being the adultery and murder with Bathsheba and Uriah the Hittite. And there's no doubt about that. But just because he had, and, and it's a grievous sin, and it's not to downplay that sin at all. But overall, when we look at King David, he, had, he has a very positive light in the Bible. He is, is, is treated as a man. And just as we mentioned this, this morning, you know, Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, is mentioned over and over again as, as a wicked king, as a bad king, as someone who, who the people, who wicked kings are always compared to as being, well, you know, he wasn't, he was bad, but he wasn't as bad as Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. And they compare him like that. Well, David is the example of the righteous king. When there's good kings, they said, you know, the, he, he listened to God, he hearkened unto God, but not like David, his father did. He was kind of setting this standard of being a righteous, godly king. And it's because of David's sake that the whole kingdom completely wasn't taken away from Solomon. Because David was good. Because David did what was right. And God had respect unto, unto the, the life of David and the works and the things that he did for him. And one of the big, strong attributes, and we're going to get to this a little bit later, but I'm going to mention it now anyways, was David's recognition of his own sins and the heart that he had and the grief that he had when he knew he did wrong, which is completely opposite to Saul. Saul had a, a stiff neck when it came to his own sin. Saul was the type of attitude that just would justify what he did and just want to say that, no, what I did was right. He was not willing to admit that he did something wrong. And this is something that frustrates God. And you can understand why it would. Anyone who's had children and you rebuke your child, you tell them, no, what you did was wrong. And they come up with all these excuses and they try to explain, well, no, you don't get it, Dad. You don't understand. You know, I did this because of this. And it, look, no, you did wrong. And they just don't want to accept and just say, instead of just saying, I'm sorry, I did wrong and just admitting it and trying to move forward and say, you know what, next time I'll handle it differently because apparently I did what was wrong. That's the right way to deal with things. And that's the way that David, we'll see over and over again, deals with things in his life when he has sin. He goes and entreats God and begs God, says, God, I'm sorry. You know, I won't do this again. I don't know what I was thinking. I was foolish, God. You know, and, and, and has that type of a heart, a soft, humble heart, as opposed to, well, God, look, I mean, I had, like, so I had to do this. I mean, you weren't here. And, the, you know, the, the Philistines were going to come down and they were going to fight us. And, you know, the people are all running away and they're getting scared. And what am I going to do? I need to entreat. God and he's just making excuses and justify, justifying his sin when there's no justification for it he just needs to admit what he did was wrong and David has that attribute and as a father you, you don't want your child trying to explain away all the reasons why they did all this stuff look it doesn't matter when you do wrong you do wrong I know there's reasons for doing wrong everybody's got a reason for doing wrong everybody does it doesn't make it okay Turn, if you would, to 1 Chronicles chapter 28. Go a little bit forward. We got first, we're in 1 Samuel. Go past 1 and 2 Kings, the 1 Chronicles chapter 28. We're going to spend a little bit of time in 1 Chronicles 28. We're going to see some, uh, some pretty key attributes of King David. King David is who we're looking at tonight. We're trying to, get some, we're trying to glean some, some learning and use David, the, the good attributes of David as an example of how we should be. And, and so that we can try to be men after God's own heart. We can possess this type of an attribute. Because I don't know about you, but that is a huge compliment to say that, that you're a man after God's own heart. But let's start reading here in, uh, in verse number 1. The Bible says in, in chapter 28 of 1 Chronicles, And David assembled all the princes of Israel, the princes of the tribes, and the captains of the companies that ministered to the king by course, and the captains over the thousands, and the captains over the hundreds, and the stewards over all the substance and possession of the, of the king and of his sons, with the officers, and with the mighty men, and with all the valiant men unto Jerusalem. Then David the king stood up upon his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren, and my people. As for me, I had in mine heart to build an house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God. 
and made ready for the building. One of the things that was in David's heart was to build the temple for God. And that was something that he came up with. It was something that came up out of his own heart because, why? Because he loves God. Because he's thinking, what can I do to, to show my love for God? You know, what are the things that I want to do? And again, it goes hand in hand with what we're talking about this morning, having a zeal towards God, but doing it according to knowledge, right? So David brings this up, and I'm not going to go back to that story either, but to Nathan was the prophet at that time. And he brings it up, and, and Nathan's like, yeah, you know, go ahead and do, do what's in thy heart. You know, you're right with God. This sounds like a good thing to me. Let's, let's go ahead and build this temple to God. And then God speaks to Nathan, and then Nathan has to go back and tell David, let's say, well, wait a minute. You know, God said that he doesn't want you to build this temple. You know, basically, it's a good thing that it's in your heart to do this, but he explains that, David, you've, you've shed too much blood. You've been a warrior. You know, you've been in all these battles. You've shed a lot of blood. I don't want the, you, the hands, your blood shedding hands to build the house of the Lord. And um, so God ordains that Solomon can do that. He accepts what he wanted to do, but he says, nope, I don't want you to do it. Now, David is a man who listens and he adheres to that. Now, think about it, how much he wants to do this. He want, and he has the power to do it. He's in the king. He has the finances, the resources, everything else. He really wants to get this done. But God said, no, it's got to be your son that does it. And he listens. He doesn't say, well, I'm just going to do it anyways. Because it's a good thing and I really want to do it. He does it according to what the Bible says, according to what God's word had told him. He listens to that. And um, it's a good thing that he had that in his heart. And what he does then, of course, we'll keep reading here. Uh, look at verse number 6. The Bible says, And he said unto me, Solomon thy son, he shall build my house and my courts. For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Moreover, I will establish his kingdom forever, if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments as at this day. Now therefore, in the sight of all Israel, the congregation of the Lord, and in the audience of our God, keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God, that ye may possess this good land and leave it for an inheritance for your children after you forever. Keep in mind, in this chapter, what we're reading, David is addressing these people. And what he's saying here, he's explaining the story of how I wanted to build this temple for God, but God said, no, I can't do that, Solomon. Your son's going to do that. And he's telling them, you know, God made this promise to Solomon, he says, look, I'm going to establish his kingdom forever if, and it's conditional, it's conditional that the kingdom will be established if, if he be constant to do my commandments and my judgments as at this day. The way it's going right now, great. If he could continue this, and you know what? He does it for a while, but he breaks the covenant. He breaks the promise when he starts building these altars to the false gods. And that's when the kingdom is taken away. And it's just like today, you know, people think that, oh, you know, the, the, the Hebrews or the children of Israel have all this right to the land because God gave it to them. No, look, these things are all conditional. God gave them that land conditionally to, to keep his commands and to look and seek the Lord. And when they don't seek the Lord, he's going to remove them from the land and take them away. Look, the people that are there today that, that call themselves children of Israel... They're not believing on the Lord Jesus Christ. They are not seeking to the Lord God. If they don't have the Son, they don't have the Father. So that land does not belong to them. It's not theirs. They're not seeking God. Maybe if they were to seek Him, then, he, then God could bring them into that land. But it has nothing to do right now with, with them. That You can't just force them back into the land. It's, if you do, it's not of God. It's not God doing it. But anyways, I don't want to get off on that rabbit trail. We're looking here. David is admonishing him, saying, Look, keep and seek for all the commandments of the Lord your God. Verse 9. And thou, Solomon, my son, know thou the God of thy father, and serve him with a perfect heart and with a willing mind. David is giving good advice here unto his son. He's saying, You need to serve God. Serve God with a willing mind. Be ready to serve God. Do it with, with, with your own will. Serve Him because you want to serve Him. And with a perfect heart, it says, For the Lord searcheth all hearts, 
and understandeth all the imaginations of the thoughts. He's saying, don't do it, you know, don't do it in hypocrisy. Don't put on a show. Do it, you know, serve God from your heart. Serve God with a ready mind. Be ready. God knows your thoughts. God knows the intents of your heart. You can't trick God. So just do it legit. Do it right. Serve God with your heart. He says, if thou seek him, he will be found of thee. If you look for God, look, he will be found. He'll make himself known unto you. But if thou forsake him, he will cast thee off forever. And you don't want that to happen. He's saying, you know, don't let God, don't cast him off. If you don't forsake the Lord, because he'll cast you off. Let's jump down to verse number 11. Then David gave to Solomon his son the pattern of the porch and of the houses thereof and of the treasuries thereof and of the upper chambers. And basically, I'm not going to read through all this, but it's, it keeps on saying how he gives him the pattern, the pattern of all that he had by the Spirit. It says he gives him the courses of the priests and the Levites. Basically, he spells out everything that his son needs to do. He gives him the blueprints. He gives him the plans and saying, this is the way the rooms are to be set up. This is the way that the, the candlesticks and the bowls and all the work for the service of the Lord is to be made. This is what needs to be done. These are the people that, you know, this is going to be their jobs. Because you remember, there's, a, there's a, a shift now. Now that they're building a temple, previously there was the, uh, the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was mobile. And, and Moses had ordained, you know, the Levite's job was to set up and to take down that tabernacle. And inside of the tabernacle, of course, they had the Ark of the Covenant. You know, they had the, the um, inside of the Ark, they had the, the Ten Commandments that were written in stone. They had Aaron's rod that budded. They had the manna. You know, they had these, these artifacts that they were keeping inside that Ark. But it was all in, in, the, um, in the tabernacle. And the tabernacle was set up and pulled down when the, when the children of Israel were wandering about in the wilderness. And then it stayed there until, they, you know, they still had the tabernacle until, this, uh, until David decided that he wanted to build a temple. So the temple was built in Jerusalem. And God said, just like he did with the tabernacle, God was very specific in saying, okay, if you're going to do this, if you want to do this, this is the way it's going to be done. And he spells it all out. We're not going to go through all that. But he spells it all out. So what David's doing, because he, I mean, because this was in his heart, he wasn't just faking it. You know, this is a lot of work to go through. David still does as much work as he possibly can, even though he's not allowed to do it. He's not allowed to do the actual project. So what he does is saying, okay, well, I'm going to get, I'm going to make it ready for my son to do. And this is a good concept to understand when you have children that, you know, hopefully your children can do more for God and do more works than you were able to do yourself. David had sin as life. David had other baggage. David was a warrior that, that you know, had blood on his hands. He wasn't able to do some of these things. God wasn't allowing him to do certain things with his life, but his son could. Maybe you've done things in your life that, that, that have held you back from being able to serve God in certain capacities, but your children haven't. And as a parent, what you need to be able to do is to be able to provide everything that your children need to the best of your ability. That's why, as we were going over our announcements earlier, you know, I'm trying to equip you to be the best soul winners that you possibly can be. So as the pastor, as, as the, you know, the, the one that's, that's supposed to be shepherding this flock and guiding and leading, I'm going to do everything in my, in my capacity to try to make things as easy for you to get done and, and, and to do all that I can for you to make you become successful. It's the same thing that David is doing here for Solomon. He's saying, I don't want this to be difficult because I, I really want this to get done. I really want a whole bunch of souls to get saved in this town, so I am going to do as, whatever it takes to, as much as I can to get other people prepared to help me in this work to go out and do this. David wants this temple to get built so bad. He's saying, I'm going to do as much as I possibly can in order to make this job easier for Solomon. And he gives him his instruction. He says, look, this is the way it's to be done. Here's the blueprints. Here's the people that are going to help you out. Here's the, you know, the way God wants everything to be done. I've already accumulated the gold that you're going to need. I've already accumulated the silver that you're going to need for all these things. Here's you know, all the materials that you need. Look, it's all right here. 
You just need to put it together and do it. You don't need to go out and search it out and find it and delay the building and everything else because you have more work to do. David put in his time and effort to make sure that it gets done. Jump down to verse number 20 or verse number 19. David, you know, because he goes through all this stuff about all the things that he's he's gotten ready for him. It says, All this saith David, the Lord made me understand in writing by his hand upon me, even all the works of this pattern. He's saying, This is exactly what God showed me. This is what God told me it was going to look like. And he gives that to Solomon. Look at verse 20. And David said to Solomon his son, Be strong and of good courage, and do it. Fear not, nor be dismayed, for the Lord God, even my God, will be with thee. He will not fail thee, nor forsake thee, until thou hast finished all the work for the service of the house of the Lord. Not only does King David get the, mater the physical materials ready, but he's encouraging and edifying his son and trying to build him up and strengthen him and saying, look, be strong and do it and don't be afraid. Look, God's going to be with you. You can do this great job. You can do this task. You can do it. I know you can do it. God's with you. Don't, you know, he won't fail you. This can be done. And, he, and he's building him up as much as possible, not just with the physical goods, but just spiritually and, and emotionally getting him ready to go. All this work that David is putting forth is a good attribute of, of looking after his child, looking after his son. And we could learn this as fathers in a, in a way to be a good father is to, to try to, to, to set up your children for success. Help them in the ways that they're going to need help in their lives in the future so that they can grow up and, and far exceed the works that you do. Jesus Christ said on this earth, when he was talking to his disciples, he said, you know, these works are you do and greater works because I go to my father. Basically, he's telling them, you're going to do even more stuff than I've done. Why is that? Because Jesus' ministry was short. He had approximately a three and a half year time period where he was out and doing these great works and miracles and everything else. But he's saying, you are going to do even more. Why? Because they're going to be around a lot longer. They're going to have a lot more years, a lot more time to do good works. Not that what they did was better than Christ. It wasn't better, but they were just able to accomplish more because they had more time to work with. Well, Hopefully, as, as, a, as a parent, you should be able to, to equip your children to do even more for God than you. I am so thrilled and excited that I, I happen to be in a position where I got right with God and started learning before I ever had my first child. You know, for some people, they have children, and then later on, maybe they get saved, or later on, they get right with God, and then they, they feel like they've wasted all of this time with their own children and not teaching them and training them right from an early age. But I, I praise the Lord for the fact that, that at the, the time when He has blessed me with children is a time when I can start teaching and training them young so that they can, that, you know, hopefully grow up and do way more for the Lord than I have. And start from a young age of loving God and doing things and not making all the same stupid mistakes that I've made. We were talking about this earlier about soul winning. How just so dumb these things are that we've done in our past that I know that I've done in my past. And there's no other, there's no better word for it than just stupidity and how much sin can just ruin your life and add all kinds of baggage and all kinds of problems and hold you back. And if you could just go back in time and just correct these things and, you know, if I could just slap myself upside the head and say, look, stupid, don't get involved in this stuff. It's bad for you. I can't do that for myself. The past is over. It's done. But I thank the Lord I am where I am today. And I thank God that at least my children, I can teach and try to you know, get this into their heads as much as I possibly can so that they don't go down the same path that I went down at an early age. But this is the type of, of father that David's being here to Solomon. And he's, he's preparing them. He's getting them ready. And, and it's all for this great work. And he has this great vision for his son. Son, you're going to accomplish more than I did. You're going to accomplish this great work. And here's how you do it. And I'm going to help you. And I'm going to give you the skills that you need. And if you need help, hey, these, these skillful men are here to help you out. And I've arranged for all of this stuff to happen. But you're going to do the work. And he, and he does everything. And, and it happens. 
And Solomon completes the work and does a great job with it. But David prepares him. The Bible says in 2 Corinthians, stay, stay, uh, flip if you would to 1 Samuel 24. Just flip backwards again to 1 Samuel. We're going to look at chapter 24. In 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians 12, verse 14, the Bible reads, Behold, the third time I am ready to come to you, and I will not be burdensome to you, for I seek not yours but you. For the children ought not to lay up for the parents, but the parents for the children. Now, in context, this is talking about when he's referring to his children, people that he's won to Christ, people that he's like, you know, mentoring or fathering over spiritually. And he's saying that, you know, I don't need you to lay up for me. The parents will lay up for the children. But this can easily be applied to a family. You know, I, I'm not worried about and expecting my children to be late. They, I don't, ex I'm not, it's not right for my kids to be laying up their money and trying to help me out financially. It's the exact opposite. I'm going to be working hard and working even harder to make sure they're taken care of because that's my job as a father. Their job as a children isn't to support me. That's backwards. My job is to support them and to take care of them. That's a, the father's job is to the parents for, to lay up for the children. And that's what we saw David doing in these chapters. 1 Samuel 24. Because David is also a man of, of integrity and humility. Two great attributes that King David had. Look at verse number one. And it came to pass when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of Engedi. Then Saul took 3,000 chosen men out of, it, out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men upon the rocks of the wild goats. And he came to the sheep coats by the way where was a cave. And Saul went in to cover his feet. And David and his men remained in the sides of the cave. And the men of David said unto him, Behold, the day of which the Lord said unto thee, Behold, I will deliver thine enemy into thine hand, that thou mayest do to him as it shall seem good unto thee. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe privily. And it came to pass afterward that David's heart smote him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. Now, what's happening here is Saul is, is chasing after King David. Well, he's not king at this time. King, Saul is the king at this time, and he's chasing after David. Saul is threatened by David because Saul already knows. He's been told that the kingdom is being taken away from him, and it's going to be given unto a man that's better than him, that's a man after God's own heart, which is King David. He knows that David's going to be king after, after Saul. He knows it. And he's out to try to destroy him. And what happens now is, you know, David's on the run and he's got his men with him. And, and he's always trying to stay like one step ahead of Saul. And they get holed up in this cave in the mountain. And they're hiding in this cave. And Saul and his company come up. And Saul basically goes into this cave where they're hiding to, to use the bathroom. So it says, the Bible says he covers his feet. He's, he's, he's dropping his drawers, basically, to, 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 to have privacy and to relieve himself. And so what David does, you know, his, his buddies with him are like, he's, he's here, you know, God's delivered him in your hand. You couldn't ask for a better situation than this. It's dark. He doesn't know we're here. You can go and you can easily just take him out. You know, God has given him into your hand to do this. So David goes over and he just cuts a little piece. Now it says this skirt. It's talking about the lower portion of his garment. That's all a skirt is. It doesn't have to be, you know, today we think of the word skirt and you automatically assume a woman's piece of clothing that's a skirt that goes from the waist down. A skirt, literally, and you can look it up even in the dictionary, it'll tell you, it, it, it can, it, of course, it can refer to that article of clothing that we know today as a skirt, but literally a skirt is just the skirt of a garment. The skirt of a clothing is the lower portion. Here's the, the skirt of my sleeve or the skirt of my pants are down at the bottom. It's that, it's that lower portion. So David just goes and he takes a piece and he cuts off a piece to show he got that close to Saul. And Saul didn't even know that he was there, proving that he could have just killed him. But he didn't do it. And it even says here that David's heart, he felt bad that he even cut off a piece of his garment let alone tried to kill him. His buddies are trying to get him to kill him. He wouldn't do it. Look at what it says in verse 6. And he said unto his men, The Lord forbid that I should do this thing unto my master, the Lord's anointed, to stretch forth mine hand against him, seeing he is the anointed of the Lord. David has integrity. David cares more 
about what God thinks and what God has done than he cares about even his own life, his own safety, or what his friends are going to think or say to him. He cares more about doing right in God's eyes. And so much that even in his heart, he felt bad for, for not even hurting him, but just taking off a piece of garment. He's saying, look, God anointed Saul to be king. God chose Saul. Saul was anointed with oil to be the king of Israel. And he's saying, basically, who am I now to just take his life and step in his place and take that kingdom when God has anointed him? He's saying, God anointed him. I'm going to let God deal with him. David knew that what David was doing was right, that he wasn't doing anything against Saul, that his heart was right, and that Saul was out to kill him for no reason at all, for no good reason. And Saul had no justification for doing what he was doing. David knew all this. He could have used that as an excuse to say, well, I had to kill him. But he didn't. Because he had integrity, because he cared about the word of the Lord, which is another reason why he is considered a man after God's own heart. Because he actually cares what God says. Now look, again, I know David had faults. I know he had flaws. I know he was a sinner and did bad things. But overall, we see this as part of his character. He did stumble and fall really bad. But this is overall a part of his character. We see this over and over again. Verse 7, so David stayed his servants with these words and suffered them not to rise against Saul. But Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. So basically when David told them, you know, this is God's anointed, we can't do this, they, they were content and they said, okay, you know, they, they kept quiet. Then it says in verse 8, David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul. So Saul goes his way and they leave, you know, he did his business and he's out of there. He had no idea that David and his men are in that cave. So after a little bit, David comes out and then he cries after Saul. He said, hey, Saul! Saying, my lord, the king. And when Saul looked behind him, David stooped with his face to the earth and bowed himself. So here we have Saul. He's hunting David down to kill him. David has an opportunity to kill him, doesn't take it. Saul turns around, what does he do? What does he, do? he gets down on his hands and his knees and puts his face down. Humility. It's the Lord's anointed. And he, and he calls him his master. You know, David's the servant. Verse 9. And David said to Saul, Wherefore hearest thou men's words, saying, Behold, David seeketh thy hurt? He said, Why are you listening to these people that are lying about me? Why are you listening to these people? Verse 10, Behold, this day thine eyes have seen how that the Lord had delivered thee today into mine hand in the cave, and some bade me kill thee. But mine eyes spared thee, and I said, I will not put forth mine hand against my Lord, for he is the Lord's anointed. And you see what he says? He says, you know, my buddies were telling me to kill you, but I spared you. There's, again, more of the merciful attributes of King David also extending mercy, which we know that God is extremely merciful and long-suffering. David is long-suffering. Saul is, is long time seeking after to destroy David. And David suffers it, allows, these, allows him to come. You know, obviously he's dodging it. It's not like he wants to die. And, and ultimately David still ends up getting, getting kind of scared and, and upset over it and discouraged that Saul continues to chase after him. But we see this attribute here of the, of the humility as it combined with his, uh, his, his merciful, mercifulness. Verse 11, Moreover, my father, see, yea, see the skirt of thy robe in my hand, for in that I cut off the skirt of thy robe. And notice, the skirt of his robe, not your skirt, the skirt of your robe, which means he was wearing a robe and cut off the bottom part. That's, that's all that means. It's real simple. And killed thee not, Know thou and see that there is neither evil nor transgression in mine hand, and I have not sinned against thee, yet thou huntest my soul to take it. The Lord judge between me and thee, and the Lord avenge me of thee, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. As saith the proverb of the ancients, wickedness proceedeth from the wicked, but mine hand shall not be upon thee. After whom is the king of Israel come out? After whom dost thou pursue? After a dead dog? 
after a flea. So we see he's, he's saying, look, who am I? I'm nothing. I'm a dead dog. I'm a flea. Why are you even bothering? You know, the king is coming out against me. What, am I, what have I done? But he takes his judgment to God. Verse 15, the Lord therefore be judge. Let's let God judge this matter and judge between me and thee and see and plead my cause and deliver me out of thine hand. And you know what? David has this attitude and that's exactly what God does every single time. All these reasons, you know, which is not what happened with Saul. Saul got scared and didn't have the faith to trust in the Lord to deliver him out of the hands of the Philistine. He took matters into his own hands. Instead of like David, Saul's out to kill me. I'm going to let God be the judge. God will take care of it. And ultimately, God does take care of it because Saul dies in battle. I mean, Saul takes his own life, but when the, when the Philistines come in battle and he's losing the battle and he was, they were going to kill him anyways, he ends up taking his own life. God took care of that. David didn't have to do any of this stuff. He didn't, he didn't have to take matters in his own hands because God took care of it. And that's exactly what David was allowing to happen. Let's see where we're at with time. Another attribute of David. Turn, if you would, to uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17. You're in chapter 24. Let's look back to chapter 17. David was a, was a fighter. He was a great warrior. And... Um, you know, he was, he, was, he was a man's man. And this is something with men today as, as you know, this metrosexual movement is, seems to be getting bigger and, and guys seem to think it's cool that they act more effeminate and more like girls and, and girls act more like guys and it's just this bizarre merging of, of the sexes. And, uh, and it's wicked and it's wrong. David wasn't like that at all. We're looking at David to be an example, a man after God's own heart. Well, we're going to look at a few verses here that talk about how David was a great warrior. Look at verse number 45 of 1 Samuel chapter 17. Verse number 45 reads, Then said David to the Philistine, of course, this is that famous story where with David and Goliath. And here we see, you know, again, it's a great summary of the spirit of David that was in David. David didn't rely in his own physical strength and might, although David was a strong man. David was able to handle weapons and a bow and other things. But that's not what David was all about. That wasn't what he what he set his trust in. Look at, look at the way that he answers this great giant Goliath. Faced with this huge monster of a man that's a warrior, that's been a warrior, that knows how to battle, that has this great armor and sword and, and you know, armor bearer and everything, you know, all this great advantage that he has over David and his strength and his might. None of that matters to David. David doesn't get scared. He's not fearful, but rather he's, he's bold. He runs at Goliath. Look at what it says in verse number 45. After, after Goliath is just disdaining him and talking down to him and trying to discourage him and saying, oh, who is this? You're going to bring a stave out to me? What, you know, bring somebody that's worthy out to fight with me, not this boy, you know. I'm going to, you know, he basically tells him he's just going to, he's going to feed him to the birds. But look at David's response to him. Verse 45, Then said David to the Philistine, Thou comest to me with a sword, and with a spear, and with a shield. But I come to thee in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom thou hast defied. He's saying, you know, you may come to me with these physical things. You've got a sword, yeah, you've got a spear, you've got a shield, but you know what? I've got the Lord. I'm coming to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, who you defied. You're the one that's cursing God. Guess what? God's on our side and God's going to destroy you. And I'm going to bring that. God's going to use me to do it. Verse number 46. This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand. He has no doubt about it. He has full faith and confidence that God is going to use him against Goliath, no matter how big he is. It doesn't matter to David. It doesn't get him scared that this is some great obstacle, that this is some great giant that he has to face. He knows the power of God and that this giant in man's eyes 
is nothing in God's eyes. Nothing. That, that power and that might that Goliath seems to have against everybody else, God doesn't even have to blink an eye. And it's true. I mean, there's no, no worldly power is going to, to compare even close to the power of God. So he says, This day will the Lord deliver thee into mine hand, and I will smite thee and take thine head from thee, and I will give the carcasses of the host of the Philistines this day unto the fowls of the air and to the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And all this assembly shall know that the Lord saveth not with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. David was not a, not a scaredy cat. He wasn't afraid to fight. He, he didn't run away from the challenge. He didn't run away from a battle. He didn't run away from a fight. He ran right into it. He runs full speed and, and takes his sling and his stone and he whips it at Goliath's head and he falls down dead. But um, the whole while, and you read, we're not going to go into all this story. We've done it in the past. He's always giving credit unto the Lord. Even when he's talking to Goliath, he's not saying, you know, I'm going to do this because I'm so much stronger and I'm better than you and, and you know, I know how to do these things better and relying on his own training and his own might. No. God's going to deliver you into my hand. God's the one that's going to do this. God doesn't need a sword and a spear to do it either. The battle belongs to God. He gets all the credit, but he's going to use me to do it and your head's coming off of your shoulders today. That's the boldness of David. Flip over to uh, 2 Samuel 22. 2 Samuel 22, we see David again giving credit unto God and how God has, has taught him to be a great warrior. 2 Samuel chapter 22. He has a bold fighting spirit. And we ought not to, to shirk away from a fight or from a battle. We ought to be able to have the boldness as long as we know God is on our side. I mean, you're, again, if you're doing what's right, you're not just getting off and all kinds of sin and stuff, and then you have this, this, this battle, this Goliath that faces you. Well, I wouldn't have boldness if, if I was in a position where I don't think God's with me. But when you know that God's with you, you're doing what's right, hey, you have all the boldness in the world no matter how big of an obstacle is in front of you. And you go charging and run full speed at that problem. You don't have to, to, to shy away from it at all. 2 Samuel chapter 22, verse number 33. This is, a, this is actually a psalm that, that David sings, that, that, he's, that he's made. Um, here in verse 33, the Bible says, God is my strength and power, and he maketh my way perfect. See, again, giving the credit to God. He maketh my feet like hinds feet, and setteth me upon my high places. He teacheth my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. Thou hast also given me the shield of thy salvation, and thy gentleness hath made me great. He's saying, you know, God has given him these skills. God has endued him with, with the ability to, you know, he says, teaches my hands to war so that a bow of steel is broken by mine arms. He has, that's, a, that's a mighty man. He's able to break a bow of steel. But again, he's given the credit unto God. He said, God's taught me how to war. God's kept me alive. God's kept me through all this stuff. And then not only do I have the, these physical attributes and the strength that God's given me, he says, but thy gentleness hath made me great. God's gentleness. And it's, it's that ability that David has also to, to extend mercy and not just be, you know, um, just always just killing people. Right? I mean, he's, he's be able to extend mercy when it's appropriate also. One more attribute of David here. I want to point out is that David loved music and he actually incorporated music into the service of the Lord and it was another good thing that David did turn if you would to first Chronicles chapter 15 let's go forward again first Chronicles chapter 15 And notice how we're going between Samuel and Kings and Chronicles because this, you know, David as a character is a pretty, a pretty major character in the Bible. We're only touching on some of the highlights of these attributes of, of David being a man after God's own heart. Look at verse number 16 of 1 Chronicles 15. The Bible says, And David spake to the chief of the Levites to appoint their brethren to be singers with instruments of music, psalteries and harps and cymbals, 
sounding by lifting up the voice with joy. So David is, is basically telling the Levites that you need to, to appoint people to be singers and musicians and stuff for the house of the Lord. Prior to that, as I mentioned, you know, when there was just the tabernacle, the Levites were all given jobs in the service of taking down and setting up and, and all of the different attributes of the tabernacle. Well, now with a temple, you don't have to do setting down and taking up. It's all there. So now you have a bunch of Levites that need you know, work to do in service. And one of the things that, that he adds here is this, he appoints them to do music and to be skillful in the, these instruments and to teach others and to be song leaders and everything else. And it's a great, magnificent um, you know, show what what a great what a great place to go to church, right? To end up going to the temple and see, you know and, and hearing all this music that's being um, sung and played for the Lord in exaltation unto God. But not only did he incorporate this music into the service of the Lord for the Levites, you know, he didn't determine which Levites were to do. He said he basically goes to the chief of the Levites and says, "Okay, you need to appoint who's going to be over these different jobs among you to do the service of God," because they were still in charge of offering the sacrifices and doing all of those things as well. But now he's saying, you know, you've got this job to, in order to provide this music. He even made instruments. Okay, I don't know if you knew that. King David actually made instruments to be used in the service of the Lord. First Chronicles 23, you don't have to turn there if you don't want to. First Chronicles 23 verse 5 says, Moreover, 4,000 were porters, and 4,000 praised the Lord, with the instruments which I made, said David, to praise therewith. So he's talking about the different, the different jobs that these Levites had. He's saying, you know, 4,000 were porters. They were in charge of the doors. And um, 4,000 praised the Lord with the instruments which I made. He said, the instruments that I made, they're using to praise God. And also in 2 Chronicles 29, verse 26, the Bible says, And the Levites stood with the instruments of David and the priests with the trumpets. And Hezekiah commanded to offer the burnt offering upon the altar. And when the burnt offering began, the song of the Lord began also with the trumpets and with the instruments ordained by David, king of Israel. So we see in multiple places there, you know, these instruments that David made and David ordained these to be part of the service of the Lord. And it's because he loved music. And, and you know, honestly, I love music quite a bit. And this is something that's a great attribute that David loved God so much that he, you know, he was thinking of ways and trying, you know, he had this great zeal to serve God and was doing anything that he could to just glorify and magnify God the best that he could. Glorifying God through the temple, which is why, you know, he want, you know, the whole temple being overlaid with gold and really ornate and beautiful and having these these people able to play these instruments skillfully and and sing and and make great sounds unto God and rejoice and be happy and praise and exalt God. David did all of these things and it's no surprise if we see David making instruments and making that a part of worship, that the majority of, of the book of Psalms, David is, is the responsible for being the author of, of more Psalms than anyone else in the whole book of Psalms. And the biggest book of the Bible is a song book, and that's what Psalms are. They're songs. They're songs that were um, created to praise and, and, and teach doctrine and um, many other things. And it's through the Psalms we're almost done. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 26. We're going to look at two of them where we can get some really good insight into the heart of David. We're going to close with these two Psalms. We're going to read through them. And you can get a really good... There's so And there's so many. When you look at the Psalms, you look in David's heart because David oftentimes is pouring out his heart unto God in prayer. And, um, you know, we're looking at a man after God's own heart. We're looking at these attributes Psalms are a great place. I only had to pick two because, like I said, there is so much content here about this, this character, this figure, David, in the Bible. And he's a great example in many ways. And we need to look at those ways and try to you know, apply them in our life and in our hearts so that we can have a heart, after, be a man after God's own heart. Look at verse number one of Psalm 26. The Bible says, Judge me, O Lord, for I have walked in mine integrity. I have trusted also in the Lord, therefore I shall not slide. Examine me, O Lord, and prove me. 
Try my reins and my heart, for thy loving kindness is before mine eyes, and I have walked in thy truth. I have not sat with vain persons, neither will I go in with dissemblers. Now this is pretty bold. David has, has a lot of boldness in his actions and the things he does, and even in this psalm. Now, I don't know about you. I don't know how comfortable I would be. You know, hopefully you're very comfortable like David is here to be able to say, examine me, God. Look at my life. Look at my heart. Look in to the, to the deepest, darkest corners of my heart and search me out, God. Examine me. Try my reins and my heart. For thy loving kindness is before mine eyes. And I have walked and I truly saying, I'm doing what's right, God. Search me out. Look at my heart. I am doing what you want me to do. And he's saying, I haven't sat with the vain persons. I'm not going to go with the dissemblers and the people who are trying to cause trouble. He says in verse 5, I have hated the congregation of evildoers and will not sit with the wicked. He says, I don't have anything to do with those wicked people. God, I'm doing what's right. Verse 6, I will wash mine hands in innocency, so will I compass thine altar, O Lord, that I may publish with the voice of thanksgiving and tell of all thy wondrous works. So he's saying, I'm not, I'm not getting involved in this wickedness and sin. Why? So that I can publish with the voice of thanksgiving. So that I can express and tell other people of your wondrous works. Tell other people about you and how great you are, God. Lord, I have loved the habitation of thy house and the place where thine honor dwelleth. Talking about how he loves church. He loves going to be among the congregation. He loves going to the house of the Lord. Gather not my soul with sinners, nor my life with bloody men, in whose hands is mischief, and their right hand is full of bribes. But as for me, I will walk in mine integrity. Redeem me and be merciful unto me. My foot standeth in an even place. In the congregations will I bless the Lord. A little insight into David's character there and his integrity. And he does have integrity. That's something that people seem to be losing by the second these days, is having integrity. Being someone who, who does what you say and say what you do. Turn, if you would, to Psalm 51. It's the last, last place we're going to turn. Last one we're going to look at. And we're going to see a little bit of David's repentant heart. Honestly, if you could get nothing else down from the sermon, look at Psalm 51 and, and remember this psalm and apply it when you catch yourself doing something wrong, doing things that you shouldn't be doing, and have this type of an attitude. Have this type of a repentant heart. I can feel this psalm. There have been, so, there have been times when I've done wrong when I've done things that were wicked in my in my past that this psalm really stands out and means a lot to me because of the the extreme grief and sorrow that can come along when you when you do something against God. And this psalm it says in the in the, the heading under Psalm fifty one, it says a Psalm of David when Nathan the prophet came unto him after he had gone into Bathsheba. This is, this is what was in David's heart. You know, remember at first, David was kind of ignoring his sin and not dealing with it. And, and, and you know, had this, this attitude when, you know, when, when Nathan the prophet came to him and he tells him about, uh, you know, that he makes up that story about the rich man and taking, taking that, that poor family's lamb and killing it. And, you know, David's like, well, kill that lamb. And when Nathan confronts him and says, you're that man. You've done wickedly. David, at that point, does not try to justify his sin. He's broken and contrite and humbles himself. And we're going to read this psalm that came as a result of, of that confrontation. And this is the attitude that we ought to have when we get ourselves in sin or when you get rebuked or when, when there's preaching that, that hits on your sin. Not to have a stiff neck, but, but have a heart and an attitude that we see in this psalm. Look at verse number one. Have mercy upon me, O God, according to thy loving kindness, according unto the multitude of thy tender mercies. Blot out my transgressions. 
Wash me truly from mine iniquity and cleanse me from my sin, for I acknowledge my transgressions and my sin is ever before me. Against thee, thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight, that thou mightest be justified when thou speakest and be clear when thou judgest. Behold, I was shapen in iniquity and in sin did my mother conceive me. Behold, thou desirest truth in the inward parts and in the hidden part thou shalt make me to know wisdom. Purge me with hyssop and I shall be clean. Wash me and I shall be whiter than snow. Make me to hear joy and gladness that the bones which thou hast broken may rejoice. Hide thy face from my sins and blot out all mine iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. He's begging God and going to God and saying, Look, God, I acknowledge my sin. God, clean me. Wash me up. I don't want to be dirty. I don't want to be defiled with this sin anymore. I want to do what's right. I want to move forward, dear God. Please help me and wash out all of these sins. Wash out. Give me, renew a right spirit within me. Give me that new heart to serve you again. Help me not to be just brought down with this sin and, and, and having a hard, stony heart, God. Renew it. Clean me up. Wash me up and help me to get back up on my feet. Verse 11, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation and uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways and sinners shall be converted unto thee. He has a heart here he's worried about and he knows when you get involved in, this, in, in, in serious sin like this, you're not going to be used of God to be able to go out and win people to Christ. If you have problems getting people saved, you know, do, do your own self-check. Do I have some major sin in my life that God's just not using me for because I'm being stubborn or I'm being rebellious and I'm not confessing and forsaking my sin to God. That God's just not, not able to use me because I'm going out as an unclean vessel, because I'm going out with someone who doesn't have the power of the Spirit upon me. When David says here, cast me not away from thy presence and take not thy Holy Spirit from me, he's not talking about being saved. He's not talking about the indwelling of the Holy Spirit because that wasn't even given yet in the Old Testament. We see God's Spirit coming upon people, which is God's Spirit and power, which is the reason why Samson was able to do the, his great works because the Spirit of the Lord came upon him and he was able to do these great things. The Spirit of the Lord came upon many people and they were able to do these great feats and they had this great power of God. And David's saying, don't take that Spirit from me because God had blessed David and had given him that great Spirit upon him to do great works. He, didn't, he wasn't talking about his salvation. That's why he said, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. You're not very joyful when you when you're get involved in these, in these great sins. You're going to be very depressed. You're going to be grieved in your heart because the Holy Spirit, especially us as believers in the New Testament, have the Holy Spirit residing inside us. And when you get involved in sin, you know that's going to be bearing down on you. And your joy is going to be gone because you're going to be guilty. You're going to have that guilty conscience. You're going to know that you've done wrong. He says, Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. Uphold me with thy free spirit. Then will I teach transgressors thy ways, and sinners shall be converted unto thee. I want to get back out there and convert people unto you. I want people to get saved. Clean me up, God, so you could use me again. I'm sorry for what I've done. This is the attitude that we all ought to have. Verse 14, deliver me from blood guiltiness, O God. Thou God of my salvation and my tongue shall sing aloud of thy righteousness. O Lord, open thou my lips and my mouth shall show forth thy praise. For thou desirest not sacrifice, else would I give it. Thou delightest not in burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and a contrite heart, O God, thou wilt not despise. He's saying, look, Lord, I know that me just bringing some burnt offering to you isn't just going to make you happy. He says, what you really want is the broken spirit. You want that contrite heart. You want me to be broken down, to change my ways and to do what's right because to obey is better than the sacrifice. David got this. Saul didn't get this point. 
Saul thought that you know doing the sacrifices was better. No, obedience is better. God wants you changing your ways. So if you you know just like the, the Catholics, they'll go out and they'll commit all kinds of sin and fornication and drunkenness, and then they'll come in on Sunday and they'll throw money in the plate and think that that's going to get appease God because they made the sacrifice of throwing in a bunch of money into the plate to absolve them of their sins, and it's not going to do anything for them. That's not what God's looking for. God's not looking for you to pay for those sins in that way. He's looking for you to change. He's looking for a broken heart. He's looking for a contrite spirit. That's what He really wants. Verse 18, Do good in thy good pleasure unto Zion. Build thou the walls of Jerusalem. Then shalt thou be pleased with the sacrifices of righteousness, with burnt offering and whole burnt offering. Then shall they offer bullocks upon thine altar. David's heart is what we're looking at. Good examples of how we ought to be. Good examples of how we ought to rule our hearts. And, and uh, especially having, having the humility, because hum humility is required to get right with God. In order to be broken, in order for your spirit to be contrite, you need to be humble, not thinking so highly of yourself. That is, that is what's going to get you to have this same type of heart that David had. Let's bow our eyes and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much for this great example of a, of a great man of God, King David, dear Lord. There's so much that we can learn, and we thank you for your words. We thank you that um, we have these examples to look at, and we know that, that no man other than Jesus Christ was perfect, dear Lord. But um, help us to learn from, both from his mistakes, but also from, from these men's um, their strengths and the, and, the, and the good things that they've done, dear Lord. Help us to lift them up as an example and, um, and somebody that we should strive to be more like. And God, I pray that you would please work in our hearts. Wash our hearts. Cleanse us, dear God. And, and renew in us a right spirit. Uh, if we're starting to get bitter or, or against doing, doing the good works, dear Lord, or whatever the case may be, Lord, help us to just, to just move forward and to, to be a man like David was, a man after your own heart, dear Lord. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.